Okay, let's look at how we can graph the inverse trig functions. So that's sec, cosec and cot. Now I've drawn in y equals sine x here as a graph. It's a little bit wonky. You should never worry about your graphs being perfect if they're hand drawn, especially in an exam. But remember when you're drawing sine, you've got all your points of interest being on the y-axis, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 1. And they go through those points of interest every 90 degrees. So as you're graphing it, put your dots in where you know it needs to go through and then just join it up with your wavy line. That's good enough. All right, so if we go to graph the inverse trig function that's associated with sine, now which one is that? Remember we use the S to remember the third letter and that is cosec x. Remember what cosec x is. Sine, no, sorry, cosec of x is equal to 1 over the sine of x. Now keep that in mind with your graph because all we've got to do is say, all right, what's the y value at any one point along this graph? What's the y value and what happens if I tip that upside down? In other words, find the reciprocal of it or find 1 over that number. Now let's look at about points of interest first the zeros and the minus ones, because that helps us out a lot. If I've got zero, what is one over zero? Well, you can't do that, can you? So straight away, cosec x is not going to be definable along that axis. So we can put an asymptote in straight away. Now, you know that the period of sine x is 360 degrees. That means it repeats every 360. So if we've got an asymptote here, every time sine x is zero, there's gonna be an asymptote every single time that happens. So we can go ahead and put asymptotes in every 360 degrees. Okay, the other points of interest are when we have sine x equaling one and minus one. Now what's one over one? It's just one, isn't it? So cosec x is going to go through that exact point. So we have a point on the curve and it's going to go through every time it's on the top of that hump. So we can put all of those dots in. What about minus one? What's one over minus one? It's just minus one, isn't it? So all of those points are also on our curve. Okay. Now think about what happens. If y is very small here, let's say it's, you know, one tenth or something like that. What happens when you tip one tenth upside down? You get 10. So the tinier the fraction, of sine x, the bigger the value of cosec x. So where it's really small here, cosec x is gonna be really, really big. Now, how big? Well, it's an asymptote. And remember, things don't come at asymptotes, you know, head on. They come in at a glancing, you know, getting closer and closer, but never getting there kind of way. So we know we've got some sort of a curve like that, and it has to come down to here. Now, as we get closer and closer to, to sine of x being one, cosec x is going to get closer and closer to 1 as well. So they're going to come down here. The graph is going to come down here and sort of echo that curve, but upside down. Okay, so it's going to head up like that. All right, now we had another point of interest here that we didn't look at. Zero. So that's another asymptote straight off. So we need asymptotes on the 180 and on the 540. Okay, so let's go ahead and put all of those in. Now this basic shape makes sense. It's going to be symmetrical, isn't it? If this one's a hump and it's symmetrical between here and here, this one's going to do the same and go up with an arrow like that. What's going to happen when we're down below? The exact same thing, but upside down. So we end up with these humps like this with arrows going up and going down and it always meets right on those points. So do you need to memorize this curve? Well, you should memorize the shape of what's going on here. That way, if you can very quickly and easy draw, easily draw up sine x, you can also draw up cosec of x by just making all the humps go the other way. Okay, this time I've drawn up y equals cos of x. Looks a lot like sine, but slightly different. How can you pick it? Well, because it always starts at the origin, um, when x equals zero, y equals one and it always starts up there. It repeats every 360, and I've put my curve in. Now, just like we did with sine, cos has its inverse function. The third letter gives it away. It's sec x. And sec x really means one over cos x. 
So we've graphed cos x here, it, it is the y value. So whatever y value we have, we need to tip it upside down, find the reciprocal of it, do 1 divided by it, these things all mean the same thing. So our points of interest, 1 divided by 1, that's still going to be 1. So we're going to have the same thing happen. But every time we've got 0, 1 divided by 0 is undefined, isn't it? So we're going to have asymptotes just like with our other curves, and it's going to happen every time cos of x equals 0. So that's every 180 degrees. We can put our asymptotes in like this, all the way along, every 180. Hold on a minute. There, and it means here, and here. Okay, now it does exactly what you'd expect it to do, just like with sine and cosec x, cos and sec x just echo each other's curves. So where we have a hump going, pointing downwards, the other curve points upwards and it goes through those same points. So you can go ahead and draw in as many of these as you like and the shape is lovely and predictable. And once you know cos x, you don't have to memorize all of the points for sec x, you could always just draw up cos x really quickly and then easily see where the asymptotes will go and which way the humps will point. And now to graph the last one, cot x. If we start with a graph of y equals tan x, we can see that we get these familiar patterns. They look a little bit like cubic curves and they happen every 180 degrees. They repeat. Goes through the origin and so that helps remind you that if it's got a 180 degree width almost, then 90 of that is on either side of the origin. So we've got asymptotes at minus 90 and 90 and so on. Now, if we remember that cot x means 1 over tan x, then we can take any value of tan x on the black curve, in other words, any value of y, tip it upside down, find the reciprocal, do 1 divided by it, they're all the same thing, and that will give us a curve y equals cot x, which we'll do in red now. Now, similar to when we found the other inverse trig functions, if you do 1 divided by 0, it's undefined. So we're going to get asymptotes for cot x anywhere that we're going through the origin here. So that means out here at minus 180 and at 180, and we're going to have that period of repeating 180 degrees. So every 180 there's going to be an asymptote. Similarly, everywhere that tan x had an asymptote, it's because it was actually trying to do something divided by zero. Now the opposite of that is actually zero, because if you tip, this was only undefined because it was something over zero, tipping that upside down puts the zero on the top. So it makes sense that this other curve, cot x, is going to go through the x-axis every time tan of x has an asymptote. Now to work out the shape of the curves, well just think through a couple of numbers as examples. Here we've got y, or tan of x, being probably a really tiny fraction. If you take a tiny fraction and flip it upside down, you get a really, really big number, which makes sense because we've got an asymptote here, so we need to approach it from some high place, or approach it as we're going up in that direction, going that way. Similarly over here, we've got a huge number, potentially going upwards to infinity. What's the opposite of a massive number? Not the opposite, but the reciprocal. Well, when you take a huge number, let's take a million, and do one divided by a million, you've got a tiny fraction, so it's going to be right down here. So knowing that we're going from here to here gives us that shape of the curve that we're going to need, and it's not surprising to find that it really echoes what the other curve is doing, but going the other way. So we've got our origin here. It goes left, high on the left to low on the right. So to draw this one, here's where it goes through um, the x-axis. It's going to go high on the left to low on the right. And that gives you your basic shape of the cot curve.